Good morning, and welcome to the Plymouth Church in Framingham's online worship. We are an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ, which is our way of saying welcome to all of you. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, whatever device you're watching this service on, welcome. You are welcome here fully. You are invited to participate fully in all that we do. We are so glad that you have taken the time this morning to be with us in worship. I'm Gregory Morrissey. I am your senior pastor. Will Tanner, our pastor for Family Life, is away on study leave this week. He will be back next week. To participate fully in our worship service, there is a link in the post of this video. Please click it and you can follow along fully. Always we ask that you like, follow, share, and subscribe this video so that it can get out into the world so more people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to know more about our congregation, please send us an email or visit our website. We'd love to tell you more about ways that we can fully include you into our ministries. A few announcements on Wednesdays. I am holding office hours from 12 to 4 outside. We're going to stick with that, even though it's getting a little chilly this past week. Even if it's going to rain, uh, we've got a tent. We will stay socially distanced and safe. Uh, just email me to reserve your spot. This past week, we sent a messenger out. Can you believe it? I hope that you received it. Uh, the last messenger, our monthly newsletter, uh, went out in March. We're excited to send this to you. If you would like a copy, if you didn't get one in the mail, please let me know. I've got a stack and I'm ready to mail them out to you. Last week, we kicked off Faith Discovery. This is a program not just for our children and youth, but for all of us to be looking for the fruits of the Spirit. This month, we are searching for love, evidence of God's presence in the fruit of love. Now, now is the time when we take a deep breath and we pause and we let all of the busyness and the harriedness and all the anxiety and all the nervousness and all the wondering and all the worry and we set it down. We come together to be in worship with God and with one another. So let us be here. Let us be together and let us worship the living God. Creator God, we lift our souls to you. O oh God, in you we trust. Do not let those of us who wait for you to be put to shame. Do not let our enemies exult over me. We seek to know your ways, O oh Holy One. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and guide us for you are the God of our salvation. Be mindful of your compassion, O God, and of your steadfast love. Do not remember the sins of our youth or our transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, we are instructed in the way. God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble the way. All the paths of God are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the covenant and uphold God's decrees. This year, we are on a quest to discover God. And the clues we're looking for, we're calling the fruits of the Spirit. In a literal sense, a fruit is the product of a plant's growing and thriving. A lemon tree grows big and strong flowers and then produces a delicious, if sour, lemon fruit. In a spiritual sense, the fruit of the Spirit is the product of God's presence in the world. That phrase, fruit of the Spirit, it comes from Paul's letter to the Galatian church. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are nine fruits of the Spirit, which means we will take one each month from now throughout the rest of the year. In September, 
we're starting with love. Where can we find examples of love in our lives that might be clues to teach us about God's love in the world? Have you noticed any acts of love this week? I found one. The first was when I realized my plants were a little thirsty and they needed watering. These two plants are my favorite. One was given to me by my sister for Christmas, and the other I gave to my partner. Plants are a great way of saying, I love you. But, and here's the second clue, to keep that love going, we have to water them. We have to give them a cozy place to live with lots of sunlight. I wonder, could we be like plants? Could we be God's way of saying, I love you to the world? To keep that love going, we have to stay hydrated and healthy, and we have to find a place where we can soak up as much prayer as we can. I wonder, can there be any better place for that than in our church and among our church friends? What have you discovered so far? Where have you found love, and what has it taught you about God? Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for loving us, for teaching us your love and how to share that love with our neighbors. We give you thanks for these clues, for these fruits of the Spirit that help us find you and learn more about your presence in our lives. Amen. A reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. Later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. What the world needs now is love. Actually, you know what the world needs now? A power analysis. A power analysis is when we step back and we objectively observe a situation or a relationship in order to determine which party has the greater power and which party has the greater vulnerability. If you ask me, what? Well, no, I, I know that nobody asked me, but I'm just saying if they... You, it's an expression, okay? If you ask, okay, yeah, I know you didn't, but if you did, I would say that this is the most important thing for us to do in our world, to have an honest assessment of who has more agency, who has more control, 
and who is more at risk in every realm, from the political to the educational to the theological to the ecclesiastical. We need to pay attention to what's really taking place. So let's begin. I know this is not new information for a bunch of you, but this is complicated stuff. It's stuff that we have to really think about, and I want this rooted into your brains, right nestled up against that part of your brain that knows the alphabet song. Power is influence. Power is your ability to make changes to and within your environment. Power is about your resources, your capacity to make choices freely. Imagine there's a light bulb. It's gone out. And it's high up in the ceiling. We have two volunteers who step forward to change the light bulb. Which do you think has the power to change the light bulb? The one with the ladder, of course. She has the resources, the ability to accomplish the task. Power is not about feelings. Power is not about perception. Power is about your ability to get a thing done or changed or turned around in your preferred direction. Here, I feel like I could solve peace in the Middle East. I believe I have some very novel ideas that could sort out some things over there. But no matter how powerful I feel, I don't actually have the resources, the capacity to achieve peace in the Middle East. Power is also relational. Power is relative. I can only say that one person is powerful when I compare them to someone else. The person with the ladder is only more powerful because there is someone else without a ladder. Now, on their own, two people are at their same level. They can meet each other face to face. But when one person is empowered, which is to say that they are afforded greater resources, made more powerful, then as a result, another party is made more vulnerable which is to say less powerful, relatively speaking, and they no longer meet face to face. Vulnerability is exposure. It's the position of less influence when in relationship with someone who has more power. This vulnerability is not a complete helplessness, but a position in which there is greater risk of harm, greater risk of susceptibility to influence. In our previous example, the person with the ladder has more power to change the light bulb. And the other one, though without the ladder, is now subjected to the choices of the more powerful person. Still with me? This is the question of a power analysis. Who has more power, more agency, more resources? And who is more vulnerable and at risk? Who do you think Jesus cares about most? Who do you think Jesus was sent to help? Full disclosure, the church is not in full agreement on this one. Plenty of congregations and leadership hierarchies argue that, that Jesus came to enforce an individual moral purity, to, to adjudicate what's right behavior and what's wrong behavior, to enforce their message with incentives, like, you can go to heaven, and, and punishments, like, you're going to go to hell. 
And, and then there are other churches who, who look more at the structural aspects of human life, the, the grand patterns that prioritize certain voices and, and set up particular stories as normal, while at the same time silencing other perspectives and painting whole groups as abnormal. We here at the Plymouth Church in Framingham lean a little towards the latter, we keep our watch on the flocks by night. We pay attention to when one sheep gets separated from the flock. And we go in search of that one. And we ask the question, why was that one lamb allowed to wander away? In my experience, the religious and spiritual traditions focused on making individualized moral declarations, the ones who are telling you what you should do without any of your own input, they are not always exactly consistent in their advice. What is right in one moment is wrong in the next. What is good in one context suddenly becomes evil in another. And their clergy? What is in bounds for them is curiously out of bounds for everyone else. When they want one thing, they say, this is normal and how things should be done. But when they want something else, they urge the exact opposite action, all the while saying the very same words. This is normal and how things should be done. This morning's gospel story opens on a confrontation between Jesus and the chief priests and elders. It's a showdown. The chief priests and elders, they have considerable power. They adjudicate the law. They set what is right and what is wrong, what is honorable and what is wicked. They are the gatekeepers of who is allowed onto temple grounds and who will be cast out into the streets. On the other hand, Jesus and his disciples also have some power. Jesus has healed countless people from Jerusalem all the way up to Syria. He has fed the hungry. He has preached a drastic restructuring of the religious and political order of his day. He has resurrected the dead. So the question of the chief priests and the elders is not one of power. They know they cannot work the miracles that Jesus can. So they ask about authority. Authority, you see, is permission. And there are two kinds of authority, earned and granted. Earned authority comes from within the relationship. It is related to consent to the consent of the willingness of, of those who are in positions of vulnerability to allow the influence of those in positions of greater power. Granted authority is formal. It, it is bestowed upon one person from outside of the relationship. Two kinds of authority. Catch this. Not all power is authorized. There is such a thing as unearned and unauthorized power, doing things without permission. Consider our earlier friend. What if she didn't own the ladder? Or, or even worse, imagine if she stole the ladder from the other person. In this scenario, the person with more resources is not so much more powerful as they are a thief and a villain. By what authority are you doing these things? The elders asked Jesus. And who gave you this authority? They aren't asking about earned authority because they know that the people are with Jesus. They gathered by the thousands in Galilee to hear Jesus preach. They heralded his entrance into Jerusalem with a parade and hosannas. For the elders, from, from their perspective, 
Jesus is stealing their ladder. They had consolidated all the resources, all the choices, disempowered all of the people so thoroughly that even the slightest redistribution of choice was offensive to them. They wanted to know who gave Jesus permission to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to uplift the lowly, to include the outcast. And every time, every time they couch it in individual moralistic terms, instead of a thoughtful power analysis, they go for the character assault. We caught this woman in adultery. You can't do that on the Sabbath. Heal, pick grain, any number of things. You broke the law, they say. You didn't have permission. Whose permission? Jesus does not play games with fools. Theirs is not a genuine curiosity. It is an attack. It is gaslighting at its finest. Jesus didn't steal the ladder from the elders. They stole it from the people. And engaging with their spectacle does not foster greater understanding or uplift those who are in need. The chief priests and elders are not attempting to cultivate empathy. They're scrambling to preserve power. They do not care who is harmed in the process. They are not interested in relinquishing control. Jesus does not play games with fools because he knows his integrity is not up for debate. His authority comes from God. His purpose is not the consolidation of power for his own gratification, for his own glorification. Jesus came down to empower the people, to balance the scales, to give voice and names to those who were at greatest risk. In the coming weeks and months, you will be asked all manner of questions you will be challenged by every variety of choice. And before you presume that there is a right and a wrong answer, a good and an evil choice, ask yourself this. Who has more power in this situation? Who is more vulnerable to harm? And then choose what fosters life. Choose what rebalances the scales. When you find that you're in the position of greater power, of expanded resources, move yourself out of the center. By empathy and compassion, prioritize the needs of the vulnerable, the poor, the oppressed, the outcast, the ignored. When you are asked to do the will of God, it doesn't matter so much what you say, it matters what you do and for whom. Amen.
What I love most about prayer is knowing that when I write or speak or give thought to my prayers, it is a conversation. I open my heart to God and God opens space for us to sit side by side for a while. I'm not alone. My burdens are shared. God asks curious questions, eager to know all of the details, but never forces an answer upon me, never pushes me down a direction, even when sometimes I would really love that. When we pray as a congregation, the same thing happens. When you type your prayers into the comment section, when you send us an email or write it down in your journal or just hold it to yourself, the church gathers around you. When you open up your heart to church, we open a space for us all to sit shoulder to shoulder in a sacred circle. You are not alone. Your burdens are shared. We might ask a few curious questions to know better how we might love you and pray for you, but we will not force our answers on you. And we will not, or, well, we will try to never fix a situation for you when you can do it yourself or when we can do it together. This morning, we gather up all our prayers and hand them over to God. That might be the hardest part, handing them over. We let go of the weight and burden and anxiety. We accept the grace that comes from a God who loves us fully and without reservation. Beloved, will you pray with me in this way? Holy and gracious God, we call upon your ancient name and ask that you be present with us today. In our struggle and in our strife, confront us anew with the holy wisdom that Jesus taught. Blessed are the poor, he said. So put our hands to work and our hearts to the task of expanding and transforming every kingdom for them. Blessed are those who mourn, he said. Comfort those whose grief cannot be consoled by words alone. Gather up every broken heart and pierced body under the shelter of your healing. Blessed are the peacemakers, he said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. God, move us to act. Move us to shout and beg and plead for peace. Stir us from our apathy. Get us out into the streets, even, even if that means risking our safety, that we might demand from the powers and principalities a true peace based on real justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he said. God, we are starving for a different kind of relationship. One that is born of empathy and service, not greed and selfishness. Satisfy also those who are actually hungry for food and thirsty for clean water. Blessed are the merciful, he said. Yet we call for the blood and seek to eviscerate our enemy, God. Calm our nerves, temper our rage, soothe our grief that we might be better that we might have more compassion. Blessed are the pure in heart, he said. Yet we excuse ourselves from culpability and evade any ownership of the problems of this world. Holy God, how can we be pure of heart if we are not honest in our story? Blessed are the meek, he said. Yet still we remain full of pride, too self-convinced to learn anything new. Humble us long enough and low enough, O oh God, that we might, that we might 
that we might inherit the earth. In the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. So how are you doing with your pledge this year? Last fall, we all gathered up our pledges, our tithes, our commitments, our promises to this church. We agreed to pay some amount into the shared basket week after week, and then whammo! Oof. The last several months have been quite the curveball in our plans. If you are having a hard time meeting your pledge, please let us know. We are here for you and with you. No one wants you to go hungry to fulfill a promise you made before the pandemic. If you have been able to keep up with your pledge, and if you're one of the people who has stepped up your giving during this time, thank you. It is humbling to realize how generous we are with one another, how connected we are, knowing that we share this ministry together. Your pledge is a holy and beautiful thing. It is generosity, it is kindness, it is service, it is funding, it is love incarnate. It is the seed of ministry bursting into leaf and stalk and branch and flower and fruit. Thank you. Let us give and give joyfully and generously to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beloved, go from this place, whatever your place may be, which is to say, leave your sanctuary, that comfortable bubble where you are safe and protected. Go out from there carrying this love of God, carrying this commission from Christ, carrying this inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and go out to declare the good news of the Gospels the uplift of the poor, the love for the lonely, healing for the sick, and liberation for the oppressed. Go out, beloved, go out into the world to share your love, for it is the love of God planted in you. Go out, please, go out to love God and love God's people, to serve God and to serve God's people. Our worship is over, so our service can start. Amen. Amen.